So we've talked, about, we've talked about the Gaussian process basics, and we've seen how GPs can be used in regression. And so now I want to go slightly beyond, slightly beyond the basics. Uh, sorry, this is, one thing, this is one thing that I wanted to say uh, during, during the break, is that uh, for more details on this, this is a book that was written by, by, uh, by Carl and Chris Williams, uh, Gaussian Processes for Machine Learning. And a lot of what we've talked about so far uh, is just uh, is just within the first five chapters. So this is this is available online, um, and 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 any more details that you want on a lot of the stuff we've talked about should be should be found here. Um, okay. So what's so what's next? We've looked at the basics. Now let's revisit the model and and see what can be what what we can mess around with. And so I, I want to use that in a very specific way and say see what we can mess around with because I want to talk about why. Normally, when we present what's next in Gaussian processes, we talk about Gaussian processes for classification. We talk about different kernels. And it's, and it's, it's, it's not always clear why, why we're doing that. And so uh, what I want to talk about is we've developed this nice model. And we've seen how it can be used for regression. But now if we start to pick at different pieces of this, we can see how it can be used for some different problems or to do some different mo in some different modeling contexts. OK, so the first thing we might want to mess around with in this model is the, hyper, is the model hyperparameters. Right? What is that? That's model selection. That's what we just talked about. So there's one option. The second option is we can mess around with the functional form of KFF. So this kernel choice here, uh, we said that this is a canonical kernel choice, this squared exponential. But there are plenty of others, and we'll talk about those uh, just now. Another thing we might want to mess with is the GP itself, the GP prior. Uh, we're not going to talk about that here today uh, because we're trying to talk about Gaussian processes. But uh, one should be aware that you can imagine having switching Gaussian processes or some other, comp some other complicated system here than, than, than just a basic GP. And the fourth is the data distribution itself. So what if the data we receive, what if the data that we measure is not these nice continuous real value variables, but something different like a class label or something like this, well, then we can still use this same GP context. We just have to change the likelihood function. Um, and we, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that and some of, the, some of the problems that that introduces in likelihood choices. OK, so let's start with kernel choices. So we talked about how the Gaussian process gives us this nice probability distribution over functions. And what the kernel is doing is it's helping us determine what kind of, what kind of functions that we get from that. In other words, this, this, this prior, what sort of, what type of functions we're, we're drawing out of this. So the squared exponential kernel is the canonical kernel for drawing smooth, uh, drawing smooth func functions from a GP. Uh, it's infinitely differentiable, and we've seen these four draws ad, ad nauseum at this point. So another kernel that we might choose is the rational quadratic. Um, I put this up here to show that, that this, is just a different, this is just a different functional form that will give us some, uh, some other interesting draws from a GP. It's actually, uh, don't, don't worry about this too much, but you see this term here is a squared exponential. And in fact, what, what this rational quadratic is is actually uh, a sum of gamma weighted length scales. So, so Z here is, this is a gamma distribution over Z, and this is, um, this would be one, one over the length scale in the, in, this, in the squared exponential. So what this is doing is it's giving us uh, a, a weighted sum of, of squared exponentials, if you will. And, and here are four draws from that. And what you can see is that uh, for a particular choice here, there's some longer range correlations than we might have seen in that squared exponential draw, but also some, some shorter range wiggles as well. So what this is to what this is to point out is this: just that with a different form of the kernel function, we seem to be getting, uh, we're still getting nice, smooth, continuous draws, but they have different, different smoothness properties and different long-range properties. Uh, one of the questions that was asked before is about uh, a periodic kernel. So we've, we've been talking about kernels that give, us, that give us these functions over time, but what about, what about a periodic function? And so what you see here is that we've, we've added what looks like um, you know, an a this, this, this exponential term. We've just put a, put a sign in here. And what this gives us when we take draws from it in the, same, in the same way, so again, we're just evaluating a kernel matrix. And we're taking draws from a Gaussian. So here are four draws from that. And what you see here is that within a particular period, 
This just looks like a draw from something like a squared exponential, but now there's this extra property that it's periodic over time. This is, um, this is, this is, this is cute, but also this is something that's very useful for, uh, uh, let's say that heart rate example, or for uh, measuring weather patterns or something like this. This is something that is actually, that, that's actually useful. Um, to up to now, all the kernels we've been talking about are stationary kernels. So, so those of us who have taken um, um, some courses in stochastic processes and things like this remember you know, uh, 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 this notion of stationary kernels, which is we've been talking about kernel functions as a function of two arguments. But in reality, all the functions that we've looked at so far are really only a function of the difference between those two arguments. So that's, that's, that's often written uh, ti minus tj or just, just, a, just k, t k of tau. And you can see that here in, in the squared exponential. So in a, in a picture, what, what is a stationary kernel? Essentially, you'll notice that uh, it doesn't really matter where I am over time. The prior looks the same no matter where I am in time. The only thing that matters is, is, is the, the difference between time points, is how much, uh, how, much, how much variance there is between time points. So there are also plenty of non-stationary kernels. So, uh, one of, one, of, one of my favorite ones to, 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 to use in this example is, is the Wiener process. So this is standard Brownian motion, uh, which we remember as uh, uh, the infinite limit of a, of a random walk. So that has the following, that is a GP, and has the following kernel function, which is just the, 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 the min of, of the two time points. And so you can see this can't be written in that stationary way as a difference between these two time points. This is still a GP, and so here's the prior of, uh, here's the prior in a Wiener process. So you can see what's happening is that the variance is growing linearly over time. Uh, again, this is standard deviation, so that's why it looks like a square root. Variance grows linearly over time, and so this is, this is non-stationary because what's happening at time zero or at a small time the space that you can explore or that you would expect to be exploring is quite a bit smaller than when you're further out here. So again, in the same way, we can just take draws from this non-stationary GP, and this looks like familiar draws uh, of, of, of a particle diffusing or something like this, which is all, which is all very familiar from Brownian motion. Um, another interesting non-stationary kernel, which I think is important to connect to because of, uh, because of all the uh, uh, all our familiarity with lin linear kernels. So now let's say that uh, let's say that we're we're saying that our regression function f of t is a linear function of t with some random random weight w. Well, then that will evaluate out if you evaluate this kernel e of f t and e of f t i. Uh, that evaluates out to the following, and that is this growing variance uh, variance envelope. And you can see then that when, when we take draws from this kernel, you just get, you just get straight lines. So this is a Bayesian linear regression or what have you. Yep. Sorry, that is that just an addition Yep. Um, OK, so building, uh, building our own kernels, um, so we've seen a handful of examples. Uh, there are a number of operations that we can use that will be helpful in, in, in building your own kernel. Why would you want to build your own kernel? Because in your particular application area, you collect this, this specific type of data and you say, oh, I'd really, like, um, I'd really like some of this feature and some of this feature, and I'd like to be able to design my own kernel that is model appropriate. So the first thing is, is that kernels are linear. We saw this when we took, uh, when we took our latent F and our noise N, and we added them together. Uh, we added those two GPs together, and again got a GP with the covariance uh, co with the kernel function that was the sum of these two. Um, it's it's linear. In other words, you can add you can add and scale these two as long as you respect positive scaling, of course. Um, you can add two kernels together to get another valid kernel. One thing that's interesting is that here we're talking about adding kernels on 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 time. But if we look at a multi-dimensional case where we've got uh, you know, latitude and longitude, we can add kernels that are, uh, we, can, we can compose a multi-dimensional kernel by adding kernels on each dimension individually. So we could have a single kernel on latitude 
a sing, uh, which would be you know, just on x1, this single dimensional, and a single dimensional kernel on longitude, we can add those two together and that will give us uh, a multi-dimensional kernel. Uh, the products of kernels are again kernels. Uh, integration gives you a kernel, or filtering context. So if f here is a GP and we've got some fixed function g of ut and we integrate across that, again, this is just, this is just a, a linear operation, then, uh, then z of t, that gives us a, that, that is also a GP and has the following kernel. This is just a standard result from uh, um, uh, filtering or signal processing. Uh, differentiation, again, a linear operation, and so this again gives us, this again gives us a GP, so f of t is a GP, if we take the derivative of that over time, call that z of t, then kz of ti tj is again, uh, uh, sorry, z of t is again a GP with the following kernel. One thing that's not discussed as, as much is, uh, is, is warping. Um, this comes up in, again, in geostatistics a lot. They call it spatial, spatial deformation. Um, but we've talked a lot about uh, regression in time or this, this fixed input space, t or x. But you can also impose a function in between there to, 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 to warp your input space uh, such that if you've got some GPF, which is usually f, you know, f on t, you can make it f of h of t as well, and that will again be a GP. Uh, something that's nice about this is that because you have, because you have a fixed kernel, the kernel is, uh, the kernel is positive semi-definite, and the in, it doesn't care about what the inputs are, and so you can, you can mess around quite a bit more with what that input warping is. <coughs> so uh, in the periodic kernel that we looked at before, you could look at that almost as a squared exponential kernel where we've done some warping of the input space onto a, onto a periodic basis. Uh, one thing that's cool about this that I want to point out is that many of these operations preserve joint Gaussianity. What I mean to say is that let's look at this linear case where we took y equals f plus noise. Well, that respects jo joint Gaussianity between all these so that y and f and y and n and f and n, they all remain jointly Gaussian. That's true of linearity, that's not true of products, but that is true of, uh, of, of these other features. So differentiation is, is an interesting example. So let's take a GP on f and we, we see that we have this, 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 this GP on the derivative of that, which we're calling z. Well, it's an interesting fact then that these are still jointly Gaussian with one another. Um, z and f are still jointly Gaussian with one another. And so that gives us this nice opportunity to, uh, uh, for example, if we measure both the function and its derivative, we can still use that in the GP modeling context. Uh, another way to build your own kernel is uh, via the frequency domain. <coughs> so we talked about stationary kernels. Um, so a stationary kernel is positive semi-definite if and only if its power spectral density function, in other words, the Fourier transform of K, is, is positive for all, uh, for all frequencies. So again, uh, this wiener kinchin theorem and the power spectral density and the existence of this uh, for a GP and all this, this is a, this is a, pretty, rich, uh, this is a pretty rich mathematical theory, uh, but, but the point of this is that if you have, if you have some function that you want to say, oh, I'd like to build a kernel out of this, let's say, um, let's say a triangle, a triangle function. You'd like that to be your, 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 your kernel covariance function. And you'd like to say, geez, is that gonna be, is that gonna be positive definite? Well, then one way, one, way to, one way to verify this is to take the power spectral density or take the Fourier transform, and you could see that the power spectral density of that triangle is, is, a, is, a, is a squared sink, and indeed that is positive everywhere, so you'd be on safe ground. One other thing that's worth noting here is that, uh, again, now that we've connected this to Fourier transforms, is that k of zero is the integral of the power spectral density. So you see that you see that your power spectral density has to be integrable because uh, k of zero you want to be um, a, a, fi a finite number. Uh, again, that's that's a little bit that's a little bit loose because in the uh, in the white noise context, for example, this would evaluate to infinity. But we see that that a, that a delta function uh, is 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 also a valid kernel. All right, so the the kernel, the summary of kernels when we've, when we've messed with these kernels now is 
Our GPs give us a distribution over functions, but the kernel determines what type of function that is. Is it periodic? Uh, is it non-stationary? Um, one of the reasons I point this out is that these can and should be tailored to the application at hand. In other words, this is, this is, what, connects, this is what connects us to our data and makes, makes it an interesting modeling application. And what we're trying to do here, and sort of one of the themes of, of, of moving beyond the basics, is to develop a GP, a GP toolbox. So this is a, uh, this is a figure from, uh, from the GP uh, for Machine Learning book. And I think this is an interesting example of how having a, a, a GP toolbox can be an interesting thing. This is the CO2 concentration over, over, uh, over a few decades from, from a volcano in Hawaii or something like this. And here's all these data points that are measured in blue. And you want to come up with some, some GP model for this. Well, you see that you want some, you want some drift over time. You want something that grows. But also, there's this, there's this reliable periodic fluctuation over the, course, over the course of a year. And so you'd like to be able to bake that in, too. So now we see that, OK, we had a periodic kernel, but we also have kernels that can, that can grow over time. So maybe I'll, I'll compose those two by adding those two kernels together. Uh, in other words, if you want to if you want to measure if you want to model your data very well, then you should go in and actually look at features of the data and design a kernel appropriately. Okay, so if there are any questions on kernels, uh, please ask please ask them now. Otherwise, we're going to jump from uh, we've just talked about the functional form of, of of KFF, in other words, different kernel choices. We're now going to talk about um, changing the data distribution. Zubin. Sure. So the question is, we've talked about kernels. Uh, we've talked about kernels on the real line. Um, there are. Uh, the question is, do I do I want to make a comment about uh, kernels on other type of objects? Yes. The <laughs> the uh, uh, so you can certainly define kernels on um, on on uh, what we talked about briefly about multidimensional spaces, right? So that's that's perfectly acceptable. You could talk about kernels on different types of objects as well. Um, so non-continuous non objects, you could talk about uh, kernels on discrete grids, you could talk about kernels on strings, all of that. Um, that is, um, I, should, I should have put an example in there uh, about that, but that's certainly, um, that's certainly a, a, a fairly developed piece of, of Gaussian processes as well. Yeah. Uh, all right, so what we've done is we've, uh, we've, we've just gone through and we've messed around with these kernel choices here. And so now what I want to do is to look at this distribution and say, uh, how, could we, how could we mess around with that? So likelihood choices. The data up to now that we've been looking at has been this nice, continuous, observed data. And that, uh, that, that made sense. Continuous regression made sense in that context. Um, in other words, I had this underlying function f and then every time I observed a noisy data point, that was just some, some Gaussian cloud around that, around that underlying function f. OK, but what if I was in a different setting? What if I actually got uh, class labels? So here I'm doing a binary classification problem. This is the, this is the same data. It's just been, it's just been thresholded to be uh, uh, above or below 0. And so now I'm just measuring minus 1s and plus 1s. So here, a uh, normal distribution on my observation really isn't appropriate, right? Because I may have some underlying f function, but certainly I'm only measuring a plus one or a minus one, so there's no Gaussian. I mean, that, that, that's very poorly modeled by a Gaussian. So, all right, what, what's, a, what's a standard thing to do in this classification setting is to use a probit or, or logistic regression model on, on these two labels, plus one and minus one. So now, for some underlying for some underlying function value, the probability that I get a label plus one, for example, is just this logistic function evaluated accordingly. The logistic function looks like this. So what that maps is that maps my, my input value f to some, uh, to, to some probability p of y given fi. So now 
what will this look like in the GP modeling context? So I've got some prior F, and this prior is evolving over uh, uh, is evolving over the continuous line. And now what I want to do is warp that F onto the zero one interval. So I want it to become a probability. So you can see now that this function I've just squashed, if you will, through that logistic curve, and now I get this function here, which tells me that over time here I would have uh, oh, let's talk about up here here. I would have a very high probability of having a plus one label. Down here, I'd have a very low probability of having a plus one label. In other words, a very high probability of having a minus one label. So, all right, what we want to calculate is the same thing that we've wanted to calculate throughout our GP regression examples. We want to calculate the predictive distribution. We want to calculate, uh, we want to calculate the predictive posterior. So uh, given all the data that I've seen, what's the, what's the underlying uh, posterior at, 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 a, at a point of interest to me? We want to calculate the posterior on the data. So given all the data I've seen, what's the underlying, what's the underlying function value at those points? Now, in the GP context, everything was happily, uh, sorry, in the GP regression context with continuous Gaussian likelihoods, everything was nicely Gaussian here, and this was all, this was all very easy. We went through these <coughs> equations. But now I've introduced P of YI given FI is this, is this logistic is squashing function. And that gives us, excuse me, that gives us an object that's very difficult to deal with because now none of these, calculating none of these, calculating any of these is, is intractable. Um, so this posterior is now intractable. Um, integrating, uh, performing this integration is intractable because of this posterior. And so again for the top distribution. So what, what would be tractable? <coughs> well, if somehow I took this intractable posterior distribution and came up with some nice Gaussian Q, so let's say that I, I come up with some method to, to map this intractable distribution onto, onto a nice Gaussian posterior, then you can see that this, this sort of trickles up and that now this is all Gaussian again. So this is a nice, easy marginalization to do. This is Gaussian, so this is Gaussian again. And this is, is a non-Gaussian term, but, is, uh, but is, 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 is univariate, right? Because I'm, I'm only querying on a single predictive point. And so this is something that I can compute. Um, so the question is, how do we get this nice, this nice tractable Gaussian posterior? This is where approximate inference comes in. So remember, all we've done is we've taken the same GP context and we've changed that likelihood slightly. And what it's unfortunately done is it's broken our ability to use all these nice Gaussian uh, properties. And so what we need to do is, 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 to, is to, sh to shoehorn our problem back into the Gaussian context. This is what approximate inference does. There's a series of methods for producing a Gaussian, a Gaussian posterior, which somehow nicely approximates the true posterior. Uh, this, is, uh, this is probably my favorite area of machine learning, uh, uh, approximate inference, and you'll see uh, uh, familiar names, Laplace approximation, EP, uh, variational methods. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go into those specifically because uh, one, it's a subject of a whole lot of research and, and we start talking about that, we'll end up talking a whole lot about approximate inference instead of GPs. And, and two, from the perspective of a GP, approximate inference I think is, 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 is really a technology. In other words, it's a technology that you want to use and bring to bear to help you solve your GP problem, something that you should understand. But, uh, uh, but, but it doesn't have bearing necessarily on how we should think about, how we should think about GPs. Um, there are, uh, it's, it's something that often works very well. Um, you, can find, you can find a lot of good literature on that to, to see how well um, approximate inference methods, EP in particular, work in Gaussian process context. But let's say for the moment that we take this approximate inference technology and we use it. What this allows is this allows us to do regression on the zero one interval. In other words, this allows us to produce that approximate posterior and then go ahead and do our, 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 our Gaussian process problem. So now what we do is we take all of our noisy data. So we've got these labels, plus ones and minus ones. So I'm putting these here at zero just so that we can, so, so that, so that we can see the, the function. Because again, the, the, the underlying logistic function that we're looking at uh, is the probability of a plus one label. So when, this is, when it's quite high, uh, you can read that as having high confidence that the, that the class label should be plus one. And when it's very low, it has 
you know, close to, close to, close to zero belief that the class label is, is plus one, which is the same as having high belief that it's minus one. All right, so we go in and do that, and what this allows is this allows us to come up with this regression function, this posterior regression function here on the zero one interval. <coughs> and you can see this traces, this traces very well. So when you've got a whole lot of clumps of plus one labels, you've got very high confidence in that. Uh, so again, minus, and then sort of in the in-between points here, for example, you've got, uh, uh, you're, you're awfully confident just based on the neighborhood of surrounding plus one labels that this is, uh, that this is a plus one label, but you did receive some negative data down here. So it, so it, so it, um, it regresses naturally between those two. So at this point, you say, okay, we just went through all that trouble to do GP, uh, GP binary classification. And so you, you might be saying, well, why, did, why didn't I just use an SVM? Uh, so one thing that I wanted to do by pointing out GP classification is to illustrate the flexibility of GPs. I'm not trying to argue that you should always use GPs for, for binary classification instead of SVMs. Uh, I think that's, a, uh, that's an argument to be, had, to be had later in the evening. Um, so one, one thing that is nice, though, is that what this does is it illustrates <coughs> the flexibility of GPs. Um, it's a nice example of when we just change our likelihood, we can still use a GP modeling context. Uh, also, it gives us this opportunity to draw an interesting connection between, between SVMs and GPs. So here's the GP joint, right? So we've looked at the, um, we've looked at the joint distribution P of Y and F. I'm going to take the, the, the minus log of that. And what you see is, uh, is this term here. So you get this term here. Here is the prior. And here's, here's the data likelihood. Now, if we look at the standard SVM loss for, for a linear SVM, right, then you have this, which is the regularization term. And you've got this, which is your data loss term. So this is, um, this is soft margin, right? So you've got this, uh, you've got this soft margin. Uh, uh, parameter C. Now, what's often done in SVMs is you can you can you can kernelize this. So instead of having a, a linear function, you can have uh, uh, you can have some basis, some kernel basis here. Um, what that leads to, and this is this is this is this is standard stuff, is um, you get this. You could write you could write your your SVM loss uh, as follows. Sorry, I should have I should have changed that. Um, what this allows us to do is, is draw this nice connection when we look at this between uh, the, the minus log joint from a GP and the SVM loss. You see that you've got the same data fit term here, and then you've got a penalty term. So, so what this allows us to see is that both a GP and the SVM regularize on your prior in this sort of way. These are not the same function, and they're not doing the same thing. But what they both do is they try to fit the data, and they regularize that with with a prior. And so there's 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 um, there's 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 quite an interesting bit of work here. One 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 paper that I like reading is 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 uh, one that Matthias wrote on the relationship between GPs and SVMs, and and he and he talks about splines as well. Um, all right, so where do we stand? We've talked about how to change the kernel. We talked about how to change the likelihood. Um, those are the two objects that I think are, are, are of most interest. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, the shortcomings of, of GP. Uh, I think at this point, it's, 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 it's very easy to think that GP is this all-purpose regression tool that can do uh, effectively anything we want. Um, in, in, in some ways, that's true. Um, and we've talked about some of the strengths of this. So, so, so the way I like to think of it is that one of the, the, the weaknesses of GP uh, grow out of the, the, the strengths of GP. So we talked about how everything is happily Gaussian and how that's a really great thing about GPs is that once everybody is living inside this nice Gaussian framework, it's, it's all kind of easy. So the, the, the weakness, of course, of GP is that that's, that's exactly true, is that when things aren't Gaussian, then we have this trouble. We have to bring in, if we have a non-normal likelihood, like we did in the GP classification case, we have to bring in approximate inference technologies. Um, when we're dealing with model selection, so, um, doing model selection over a number of these hyperparameters, uh, 
uh, can, be, can be awfully tricky because it's, it's non-Gaussian, so you have to decide, should I optimize these model parameters? Should I try to integrate over these model parameters? Should I approximately integrate over these model parameters? Um, uh, uh, that, that doesn't quite fit into this simple GP, uh, simple Gaussian modeling context. Uh, another great strength of Gaussian processes are the non-parametric flexibility of this, right? So we talked about how you don't get some fixed parametric set, but rather uh, 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 your model grows with the complexity of the data. And the downside of that, of course, is that we have to compute on all the data. So here is this term <coughs> that we've looked at a whole bunch of times. And we said that one of the nice things about this is now, say, our posterior mean, for example, is just a linear function of the data that we've gathered. Why? Okay, th that, that remains true, but there's a couple terms in here that are really quite frustrating. So one, for example, <coughs> is probably the, big, the most frustrating is this KYY inverse. So let's say I've collected 1,000 data points then I have to evaluate KYY, take the inverse of that. So that is uh, cubic in runtime and uh, order n squared in memory because I have to keep, keep that, that, that matrix around. And that's true, um, that's true of all these terms together. This is all cubic runtime and quadratic in memory. So if I've got 1,000 data points, okay, that's fine. But if I have uh, 10,000 data points, 100,000 data points, a million data points, then I'm really starting to get really starting to get into trouble. In other words, certainly we can't, uh, with modern computers, we can't naively just compute these, compute these Gaussians. Um, and so this is, this, is one of the, this is one of the shortcomings of GPs and, 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 and I think one of the limitations why it hasn't been used in a lot of uh, large-scale modeling context and large-scale data context. So what this brings in is that, okay, we've got cubic runtime, order n cubed. So there's two things you might think about doing. One, you might think about making that n smaller. So what if I can come up with some methods that are instead order m cubed, where m is smaller than n, or order n m squared, where m is much smaller than n, and so that, that linear piece of that doesn't matter as much. One other thing you might think about doing is just trying to make that three smaller. And so those are sort of the two ways, uh, those are sort of the two ways that GPs, people have tried to make, sorry, I should have bumped this up higher on the slide, I see a lot of people craning, craning their necks. Um, uh, these, these are the two ways in which people have tried to make GPs uh, uh, work more quickly. Um, one is sparsification methods. So this, is, this, falls under the, this falls under the context of trying to take that, that value n and, and, and making that into a smaller number. So if instead I had some, some set of pseudo points uh, that was in some way quite useful and quite predictive, I could use that instead and that would get me m squared n or, 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 or at order m cubed. Sorry, question? Yeah, I didn't think cubic runtime makes you guys busy in any way. Sure, so in, 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 in training, yes. But then once, you're, once, uh, once you've calculated an SVM, you just get that nice uh, uh, regression basis and in test, it's much, more, it's much quicker. Right? It's also SVM's worst case then, cubed. Typically, for most data sets, it's, um, it's, the, it's the number of support vectors by n, is that right? I mean, no, nobody trains SVM with a cubic matrix nowadays. Yeah. Sure. It's, the, sure. It, it's because of the sparsity, because uh, SVM is naturally sparse, whereas Gaussian processes, you have to retrofit the sparsity um, in order to get to the same type of effect. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So there, I mean, but, but certainly the, this, this equation, um, except in special structure, which we're just about to talk about, is order n cubed in every, every case. Right. Yeah, so, so the, um, the second type, the, so the second, the second way in which people try to make GPs faster is to say, okay, well, I've got some special structure in my KYY, um, uh, and, and so I don't, need to, I don't need to actually form this full matrix and do a full inverse, right? So there are a whole lot of matrices. So, so, so a, a, a linear kernel, for example, certainly would not have, um, certainly you, you, you'd be a fool to create this whole, this whole matrix and then try to, try to invert that, I mean, for, for a number of reasons. But um, a, another thing one might do is um, if, you've got, uh, if you've got a fixed basis of input points, in other words, base, uh, input points on a grid, for example, then uh, your, your, 
kernel matrix, if you have a stationary kernel, is going to be toplets, and then those can be inverted in order n squared and sort instead of order n cubed. So there's a whole bunch of um, there's a whole bunch of methods for uh, particular structure given the kernel choice and given uh, um, the sequence of your input points that can be that can be brought to bear on this. Um, and, and, and I suppose this is, this is one of the things I want to point out is that the shortcomings of GP are also a proxy to where a lot of the active research is going on. So what we just talked about there was comp computational complexity, uh, sparsification. There's a lot of interesting work, a lot of interesting work there on making GPs faster. Um, also on approximate inference. So when you get some new kind of data and you want to model this in a GP context, uh, you may need to make particular choices in that approximate inference technology. Uh, and then I'm just, I'm just adding this here just, just for completeness. Uh, one of the main uh, active research areas of, of, of GPs is how to, how to apply those. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was connect, connecting, yeah. GPs, connecting GPs to other technologies in machine learning. So already we've seen how uh, we've seen GPs fit into a couple other places. We talked about uh, uh, we mentioned Wiener processes, uh, uh, Brownian motion briefly. Uh, we mentioned linear kernels and doing Bayesian linear regression. Uh, we talked very briefly about the connections of GP classifiers to uh, SVMs. So the question is, what 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 other technologies? What 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 else does this remind me of when I talk when I when I think about a GP? So one thing that 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 I think often often comes up is uh, temporal linear Gaussian models. So, okay, so, so the Wiener process was an example of that. Uh, linear dynamical systems, uh, so state space models, things that come up in Kalman filtering applications, smoothing applications, et cetera. Uh, this, is, this is a canonical model for that, so you've got some, some latent linear dynamical system that evolves over time. So this is, um, this is, your, this is your latent, it's just, it's just additive noise. Um, and then, sorry, this is your, this is your likelihood model is additive noise and this latent crawls, crawls over time in this linear dynamical system. Um, that again is a GP. Uh, more generally, Gauss-Markov processes, so uh, 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 autoregressive moving average processes, uh, things that have this AR term and, and, and this moving average term uh, according to certain conditions, for example, as long as this is um, additive Gaussian noise, this is again a Gaussian process. Um, these are discrete these are discrete versions uh, of, of these, but the same is true for their continuous time analogs. What, what, all, all I'm trying to point out here is that this intuition of linearity and Gaussianity, so you say, oh, there's all these models that we have that have linear operations and have Gaussian noise and have Gaussian random variables, would they be GPs? And, and, and indeed, uh, uh, that intuition is valid, they, they, they are GPs. Um, there are a number of other non-parametric models uh, that, that, that we've seen throughout the course of, uh, of, of, of statistics and machine learning. So one is, uh, one is kernel smoothing, uh, uh, um, locally weighted regression. So what, what's that? You take some, you take some kernel here, um, and, 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 and this kernel doesn't have all the, all, all the constraints that we've, that we've just talked about. But essentially then you say, my, predictive, my prediction at any new data point is just a weighted sum of, of, uh, of, of the data points that I've seen so far by some weighting. And what I want to do is compare that to uh, what we've seen in the GP context. So we've seen that the GP posterior, posterior mean here is again just a linear weighting, is again just a linear weighting of the data that I've seen so far. So in that way you can see that a GP is effectively a kernel smoother. It's just a kernel smoother that has uh, this 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 changing kernel over uh, as you as you collect more and more data points. Um, one other thing that I, that I think is important is um, to connect this to the neural network literature. So uh, I suppose one of the places that GPs for machine learning grew out of was out of um, looking at infinite infinite limits of neural networks. Um, in particular, there was there um, there was a cool uh, a cool paper that that Radford. Neil wrote in 1996. This is how a lot of people, if you look at some of the early tutorials in GPs, this is, this is often mentioned. I think that now there's, there's fewer people that are learning machine learning via neural networks, and so it's, it's maybe not as helpful in intuition. But essentially, if you've got, uh, if you've got some neural network, and here's your, um, here's your hidden layer, and you've got these, 
uh, these noisy weights VI, which are Gaussian distributed, then as, 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 you take, uh, um, as you take M to infinity, that converges to a GP uh, with a specific kernel, and, and you, can actually calculate, you can actually calculate that neural network kernel, which is a kernel that's used sometimes in GP modeling as well. Okay, so we're surprisingly a little bit ahead of time, um, but I'll just briefly conclude about what, what we've talked about. So we've seen that GPs can be effective tools for regression and for classification. Um, one thing that we, didn't, that we didn't harp on a bit, but it's something that, that is true of GPs as it is true throughout a whole lot of, of Bayesian modeling, is that we have quantified uncertainty. So we're not just carrying around, we're not just carrying around a regression function. We're actually carrying around the uncertainty about each point in that regression function. And that can be really useful when it comes to using GPs for things like control. Um, furthermore, GP can be extended in interesting ways. So we've talked about how to change some of the features of GPs, but what I mean here is that GP can, can, can be slotted into a whole different thing, a, a whole bunch of different technologies because of this, this linearity, because so many technologies that we have uh, in, in, in statistical modeling are, are based on linear models. So I think Neil talked about the GPLVM. That's an example uh, 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 to some extent of taking GPs and slotting that into a dimensionality reduction technique. Um, furthermore, the, the, the final point is that GPs appear as limits or general cases of a number of, of, of machine learning technologies uh, and, and it bear quite a lot of similarity. Uh, finally, GP are not without problems um, and, and so that, that, that is why it remains a, an interesting and active area of research. Uh, last thing, some, some references, pointers, credits. Um, I showed a picture before of this book. I think that for somebody trying to, trying to come up to speed on GPs or GP tutorial, um, this book and the code that goes along with it uh, is really quite useful. Uh, also, I think um, uh, uh, Chris Bishop's book is, is, is quite useful in, in connecting GPs to some, to some of these other technologies. Um, there's, a, there's a website where you can see a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the papers that have been published on GPs. Um, just in case you get confused between GaussianProcess.org and GaussianProcess.com, I think this one's been more recently updated. Um, and then finally, uh, really, if you want to look at NIFS, ICMML, JMLR, AI stats uh, for about the past 12 years, that's where a whole lot of GP work has been, has been published. That's it, thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> question, there was a question. Oh, sorry. So I'm, uh, I'm referring to, uh, here I'm, for order n cubed and order n squared, I'm referring to inference time, right? Um, but calculating the, calculating the marginal likelihood and the uh, derivatives with respect to the marginal likelihood has the same, has the same complexity, yeah. I think that this um, this cubic inference time is 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 has been pretty well 
uh, has been pretty well poked at by, by, by a whole lot of people. So that, you know, my, my intuition is that, is that there, there, there is some, some disconnect there, but do you, have any, do you have any comments about that? Sorry, I missed a bit about the connection with the SDN uh, thing. Uh, so can you repeat, summarize the question again? when you're doing Gaussian process uh, stuff is you also have to compute the posterior covariance. And even if you can compute, well, often the mean is some one thing you can approximate, but then you right. actually have to approximate the covariance as well. I'm not sure how that affects um, that analysis. And also, you said stationary. I know there's a lot of really cool work, um, including a material by Eunice Sachi, the thesis that Zubin and I just examined, <coughs> which looking at where you've got um, uh, grid laid out points, um, yep. which uh, yeah, uh, which allows you to then structure your covariance and compute it a lot more efficiently. Um, and I think that we haven't e explored enough in that direction. So I don't know if they're using that trick as well, where the points are uniformly spaced. Um, that can help. Bernard's got comment. So I think this uh, this insight that you can work in a finite dimensional subspace is probably re already older than two thousand seven. Already before related this to the spectrum of the kernel and, and that rates depending on the eigenvalues. Uh, and I also remember some work which is probably also before 2007 where people have used the Johnson Newton Stark theorem to do random projections. So I'm, I'm, it's sort of an idea that has been around for a while. Is that a, the, the smaller and um, is that related to the smaller and bar stuff as well? Um, maybe. And then also there's the stuff on Nystrom approximations, which are about uh, trying to approximate, it just occurred to me because Bernard's mentioning the approximating the eigenspectrum, but they're not, I don't know, it depends, I guess, what you mean by arbitrarily close, I mean. Uh, so, so, so one thing, one thing you, you do see in GP, which, which, which connects a lot to this, is, is that if you can, um, so we talked about here, we mentioned the, the linear kernel, for example, right? And, and what makes the linear kernel go fast in this context is that it's got a it's got a fixed it's got a fixed rank essentially it's it's it's. Essentially, don't you tell you that you can approximate your nonlinear kernel using a linear kernel? Sure. Linear sure. Kernel sure. Fast, yep. maybe work fast, I think, the yeah. 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 So one of the one of the one of the pieces of research is going on I think in in sparsification. Well, it kind of crosses the boundary between sparsification and using special structure. Is if I've got some kernel that I can that I can um, that I can approximate arbitrarily well or very well with some fixed rank, then I've reduced the complexity of my problem from n cubed, uh, uh, of this inversion problem from n cubed, yeah, down to that. Yeah, so, so, so that, th that may indeed be the, be the connection point. And, well, one thing that happens, so the methods that people are using, uh, these pseudo point methods that John mentions here, um, that they also, they tend to do a really good job of approximating the posterior mean function. But what they lose uh, is actually approximating the posterior covariance structure. So if you sample from the posterior, what you see is the error bars look good, but in regions where they don't put these pseudo points, you have no correlation structure across the function. Uh, so, you, I mean, but that becomes, that's far less apparent with sport vector machine type literature because then you only care about the mean function. You're not actually trying to approximate this uh, covariance structure. So I think that that, that potentially does highlight a big difference between the areas. And it's actually a headache. For, for Gaussian process people, the big headache is retaining the variance, because it's the variance that allows you to optimize the hyperparameters in effect, retaining that uncertainty. Um, and for regular kernel methods, you can just discard it, and it makes your life an enormous amount easier. Yeah, so, so maybe, that's another, maybe that's another thing we should think about that's, that's both 
one of the weaknesses and the strengths of Gaussian processes is that you carry around this uncertainty, which can be hugely valuable, but is really quite burdensome to calculate, right? And a lot of a lot of other methods, you don't, you know, you're only focusing on you're only focusing on this posterior mean or the regressor, if you will, and so you don't have to even consider the complexity of, or y your model isn't even set up to, to consider the complexity of calculating a, a posterior covariance. Yeah, and, and in fact, it's the exact point, the non-normal likelihood leading to proximal inference is because you're trying to propagate the uncertainty through that non-normal exactly. likelihood. Yeah. In, in the small vector machine, the reason the inference isn't proximal is because you're looking for a map. From the Gaussian process point of view, you're looking for a maximum of posteriori solution, so it's a point-based estimate of a function. So squeezing it through a nonlinearity doesn't matter. You don't have to squeeze the Gaussian through the nonlinearity, um, and, and that's why it's sort of easier to do. But at the same time, once you've done it, you lose the ability to optimize um, the marginal likelihood and recover the kernel parameters. Um, so in some sense, I think they're very complementary methods in that sense. That Anything else? Yeah. The short cutting to multi multivariate and Gaussian processes are like the same like all uh, other regressors or because it, it seems that it would be the uh, computational expenses to <coughs> scale in dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, so so the question is the question is the shortcomings for um, the shortcomings for GP are, it's, are how, how much worse does this get when you have multiple input dimensions? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it doesn't get it doesn't get worse essentially because the the points that you care about here this is the number this is the number of data points that you've got and whether those data points are indexed on a single temporal point or on latitude and longitude or things like that it doesn't particularly matter because when you evaluate the kernel matrix you're only evaluating you're, you're only evaluating those functions once. Right, so it scales, evaluating, evaluating the kernel matrix scales linearly with, um, with, with D, the dimensionality of the input space. Now, if you get to um, things like special structure methods where you're dealing with uh, points on a grid or something like this, then, then you start to run into trouble because you can't use, you can't use a lot of those methods as seamlessly. Um, and that's some of the work that, 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 that Neil was mentioning. Um, but yeah, so, so for multi-dimensional multi-dimensional input Gaussians, you have to consider special structure differently. But but besides that, the vanilla GP now the computa computational complexity is the same. <coughs> okay, thank you.